Welcome, Don. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me, Jack. Pleasure to oh, be here. Oh yes, it's a, it's it's our honor, really. It's a, it's our privilege to uh, to have you here. It's, we're a bit surprised you accepted the invitation. So thank you for that. <laughs> so uh, thank you. All right. So for everyone here, thanks for thanks for coming. Um, we're gonna have. Um, my name is Jack. I'm in hosting this event with Donald Hoffman together with my co-host Raman. Um, if you guys want to ask questions, you can just tap the show. You can tap the hand icon so you guys can queue up for questions. And um, when you come on stage, be sure to mute your mic or um, we don't want anything weird to happen. Um, with that said, um, I'm going to introduce Don for the people who are not familiar with him. Uh, he's a... Um, let me see, got it right here. Um, Don Hoffman is a professor of cognitive science at University of California, Irvine. Uh, he's the author of The Case Against Reality, How Evolution Hid the Truth from Our Eyes, and Visual Intelligence, How We Create What We See. He proposes uh, the interface theory of perception, which entails that evolution shapes our perceptions to be structurally non-veridical. Derivative from the interface theory of perception is his theory of conscious agents, which states that all aspects of reality are ultimately dependent on consciousness. Is that a fair introduction, Don? Very good. Thank you very, very much. Very good. Great. <laughs> Okay, then um, I'm just, um, to get started, I want to ask you for a brief summary of your position. Oh, very good. So, science for several centuries has been based on the assumption, the successful assumption of the ontology of space-time, so that space-time is fundamental, space-time and its objects, and the methodology of reductionism that as we go to smaller scales in space or space-time, we will find more and more fundamental laws. And this has been spectacularly successful for centuries. But the glory of science is that its theories are so precise, they tell you their limits. And our theories of space-time um, and of evolution by natural selection agree that space-time cannot be fundamental. So the physicists are saying space-time is doomed. Um, space-time is not fundamental. It will not be part of the fundamental laws of physics. There's something deeper, and space-time is not it. And evolution by natural selection, uh, I and my, my co-researchers, Jaitan Prakash, Manish Singh, um, Brian Marion, Justin Mark, and several others, Kyle Stevens, uh, have been showing that evolution by natural selection agrees with what the physicists are finding from quantum field theory that space-time cannot be fundamental. And so this is, this is perfectly fine. This is, this is great. Space-time has been a wonderful framework for several centuries. Reductionism has been a great methodology for several centuries, but it's now time for the next generation to find deeper um, and, and more powerful framework to, to do science in which space-time will emerge as um, a projection of a much deeper theory. So, so that's one aspect of, of the work that I'm doing. The other aspect is to say, okay, well, what is beyond space-time? And of course, the answer is we don't know. This is that our theories of you know quantum field theory and evolution by natural selection are, are deep enough and powerful enough and rigorous enough to tell us where they stop, but they cannot tell us where to go next. That's up to us as scientists to make bold leaps into the dark make them precise, and then make predictions that we can test back in space and time where we can make measurements. And so, so of course, our first leaps will be wrong, but um, you know, the physicists are going after things like the cosmological polytope and the amplitudehedron. They're finding these deep structures beyond space-time. And I'm working on a, a model of consciousness that we call conscious agents and trying to show that the asymptotic behavior of that theory could potentially connect with the structures that the physicists are finding beyond space-time. So, so in other words, when we're trying to study consciousness in the human brain, it was reasonable up until a couple decades ago to start with objects in space-time, like brains and neurons. But, but now our science clearly tells us that um, if you do that, um, you're dealing with something that's not fundamental, and you're, you're essentially wasting your time. So, so it's time for the next generation to be bold and step beyond space-time, but then whatever theories we get, project them back into space-time to see that we can make tests. So that's sort of the idea in a nutshell. I uh, lost your audio. 
Thanks. I good. still have to get used to the setup. You can hear me now, right? Okay, thank you, Don. Yes, Perfect. very good. Thanks yeah. for that. Thanks yeah. for that introduction and the summary. Um, Roman, I think you have some questions for um, for Don. Yeah, uh, thanks for being thank here. Thank you, Roman. So uh, the first question is from Els, and that's, are you still doing research on this topic? Where can I read new findings from your research? Yeah, yes, we're still doing research on this topic. We have a paper um, in Entropy that, that came out a year ago, I guess, um, with some new mathematics on the, the evolutionary stuff. So if you want to actually get into the mathematical hardcore, there's that. that. We've also got a couple papers in progress right now, one responding to some research at Yale um, that, that, um, that should should be quite interesting. We, we've done some new simulations, uh, but they, we're writing that paper right now. It probably won't be accessible until the end of the year or so. Um, and uh, my my co-author Chaitan is is doing a new theorem as well, tightening up some of the results that we found earlier. We we it, we we, <clears throat> he, he, we published um, Fitness Beats Truth paper, and Chaitan discovered that he could make the our result even stronger. So he's um, T tightening up the math and making this it, so it's even more in our favor um, yeah, that that the probability is very very low that any system would be um, shaped by natural selection to see reality as it is in any respect. So so yeah, and then we're we're continuing to do work on the the theory of conscious agents and tying it in with um, <clears throat> some structures beyond space time. But this is very very deep work. Um, the uh, I can tell you that. The, the direction I'm focusing on myself, there's a, a class at Harvard uh, that, that Nima Arkani Hamed gave in 2019. If, so if you Google Nima Arkani Hamed Harvard uh, 2019 um, and start with his lecture one, uh, he's got 25 or 30 lectures that he gave where he basically tells a graduate class what are the new structures beyond space time. So space time is doomed. That's what the class is about. Space time is doomed. It's over. It's had a good ride for several centuries, but it's over. <clears throat> Here are the new structures that the that the leaders in physics are finding, and <clears throat> so so if we if we want to understand consciousness, it's not enough to be Newtonian or even quantum quantum theory. That's that's not the forefront anymore. That's quantum theory itself must arise from this deeper deeper theory. This deeper theory that Nima is looking at has no Hilbert spaces. <clears throat> so. So it's not enough to start with quantum theory. That's not deep enough either. You have to go beyond to these polytopes, like the cosmological polytope and the amplitudehedron. And so, so the the question is, how will our theories of consciousness connect with these deeper theories that physicists are finding beyond space time? And so that's what what I'm working on. And I'm the basic idea is that the asymptotic behavior of the dynamics of conscious agents um, may give rise to the kinds of polytopes that the physicists are finding. So as you can imagine, this is a very ambitious project. We're not going to be done in a few weeks. Um, it, it, it will be, this is probably several year projects. So, so yeah, we're basically we're working on both fronts. We're getting new theorems about uh, evolution by natural selection, but my, where my heart, but for me, that's pretty much a closed chapter that, I mean, that's, that's done, but we'll respond to, you know, research questions from other groups like the group at Yale. But for me, the real fun is to try to understand the new structures beyond space-time that physicists are finding and seeing how a theory of consciousness might connect with those. Uh, so when you talk about the research at Yale, are you referring to the paper that uh, attacks your theory from Gibson's perspective? Because that's something I came across. There's a paper by Brian Scholl and, and some of his graduate students and colleagues. Um, they, they, the, their paper has not been released um, publicly, I don't think, um, unless it's been done since I, you know, re very recently. They, they gave a talk at, at a conference, and so there is an, an abstract where they present their results. And, and essentially, their results. The, the approach that they take, and, and by the way, this is, I mean, Brian Scholl is very, very good friends with uh, someone in my group, uh, Manish Singh. They, they were postdocs together at MIT, and so they're all, you know, they're, it's all very friendly. But we're all trying to understand what exactly does evolution by natural selection entail. And so Scholl's group said, look, um, you know, the work that, that my team has been doing focused primarily on a single 
fitness payoff function and showing if you have one payoff function um, that's governing the behavior of, of the interactions between some organisms, then in that case, organisms that see the truth will go extinct when they compete against organisms of equal complexity that are just um, tuned to the payoffs and not to the truth. And so what, what Brian's team suggested was, well, if we have, instead of one payoff function, we have thousands, and they went up to 20,000 payoff functions. And then the system um, will have to, to deal with all these payoff functions. And, and so they made certain other restriction, uh, restrictive assumptions, but they found in, in that special case that then truth would win, uh, or, or versions of truth would, would win. And so when we looked at what they did, we realized that um, they, they weren't allowing the organisms to essentially data compress the payoff functions into, what, into objects. So if you take a bunch of payoff functions and you do hierarchical clustering, so you take fitness payoffs that are sort of very similar in their structure and group them together, make an approximate data structure for them that we could call a unit or an object. And then once, once you do that, once you allow the organism that flexibility, then once again, um, you get these nice, simple structures that aren't the truth and seeing the truth goes extinct. So, so our theorem is not that you cannot find conditions in which truth will win. Our, our theorem is the probability is zero that those conditions will, will occur. And probability zero things can happen. So it doesn't mean that they cannot happen. It just means that, that it, any sober analysis of evolution of a natural selection would say um, that's, that's not an option that's worth taking seriously. So. All right, thanks for yeah. clearing that up. So uh, the next question is from Monistic Idealism, and he asks, are you a monist or a pluralist? Is there one fundamental conscious agent or many? And why do you accept that view? Monism well, the answer pluralism? is both. So it turns out that the mathematical model of conscious agents that we have, and, and you can look at the math yourself, it's, it's, it's published. The paper is called Objects of Consciousness. So if you just Google my name and Objects of Consciousness, it's online and it's free. <clears throat> so you can get that paper. And, and it turns out that uh, the definition of conscious agent, the way I thought about it first when we were writing it down, was there were multiple conscious agents interacting. And so I had a bunch of conscious agents. But it turns out when you look at the math, when two agents interact, they constitute, they satisfy the definition of an agent. So they are an agent. And, and so there is one agent. And there's also many agents, and the mathematics um, basically shows that the notion of agent is something that you can use to look at the whole or to give an analytic um, access that is wonderful for science to actually do an analysis um, and, and look at it uh, in terms of its moving parts. So the answer is, is yes, and the dichotomy goes away once you get mathematically precise. You know, when, we, when we're not using mathematics, you might say, well, you have to either be a monist or a pluralist, and the answer is no. Once you have the mathematics, the mathematics actually teaches you that you can do, do both um, in one framework. <clears throat> All right, I have a question from myself, and that is, why has this work not fundamentally changed the existing paradigm? Your team has produced proven theorems in evolution by natural selection, indicating that non-veridical perceptions are almost certain. Isn't that a really big deal? Well, well, um, I, I think that the the re there's good reason for it, and I didn't expect this to just take over by storm, um, and maybe not even in my lifetime. I'm not, I'm not at all surprised. Science, justifiably and rightfully, is a very conservative process. And space-time has been taken as fundamental for centuries. Reductionism has been taken as a fundamental methodology for, for, um, for decades, even centuries, and has been very, very successful. The the discovery in physics that space-time is doomed is relatively recent. It's only 20 or 30 years. Um, but, and and the, the part of the problem is, how do we think outside of space-time? How do you think outside of time? Right, this is, this is, this is a new trick. We're, we're old dogs and this is a new trick. So, so we, we, we're so used to thinking inside space-time that it's 
almost inconceivable to us. Every objection automatically comes up because that's the way we, um, you know, from the evolutionary point of view, that's the way we've been programmed to think. We, we've been programmed with space-time as a headset. So it's no surprise that um, this is not easy for us. However, it, what's, what's remarkable is the physicists are finding these structures like the cosmological polytope and amplitudehedron and associahedron beyond space-time where there are, are no Hilbert spaces, so there's no quantum theory there. Quantum theory emerges with space-time. Neither one is more fundamental. They, they emerge together. And time itself is not fundamental. Time emerges as a projection. So, so part of the problem is our conceptual system and the way that we're wired up by evolution. But another part, if you look back in history, right, when we got evidence that the Earth isn't flat, it, that didn't take the world by storm. I mean, there, there people disbelieved for a long, long time that the, you know, the of, of course the Earth is flat. You fool! You can just see for yourself. And then when we finally, you know, we had to accept that the Earth is like a sphere. It's an oblate spheroid. <clears throat> but then we said, well, the Earth is the center of the universe, I mean, and and Earth doesn't move. And any fool can just look up and see what the, the sun, moon, and stars are moving. Look, the ground isn't moving. Surely the Earth isn't moving and everything rotates around us. Any fool can see that. And um, when Galileo said the Earth moves, he was sent to prison. He had the evidence. Well, he was, you know, he was put in house arrest. He was, he was threatened. He was threatened with torture and put under house arrest. And it, it, was, it was just, even though the scientific data was there, it was incontrovertible. I mean, Galileo was right, and, we, and anybody who looks with an you know, open mind at what Galileo found, the, it, the case is closed. But that, the case was not closed, and, and so you know, we have this you know, proclivity to you know, disbelieve that we could have been so wrong for so long. And now, you know, a flat Earth and the geocentric view of the universe are trivial compared to our commitment to space-time. That commitment, to, the commitment to space-time, is far, far deeper than flat Earth or geocentric universe. This is the big one, and letting go of this is is going to be transformative to us personally in our self-conception and to science. And so this is the big one, and I don't expect it to. I, I, I would be surprised if I see this generally accepted within my lifetime. I would I would be delightfully surprised. Um, I, I would like to see, but what what I hope is that the I mean, my generation, we just have to die. You know, but the new generation, the young folks, are the ones who will, in every case, come to the rescue of humanity and are willing to embrace the new ideas and explore them. And so I think the the younger generation, and in physics, for example, Nima Arkani Hamed and the, the the group that he's working with, the, the, this younger group are are really brave and, and plowing ahead. And I, in cognitive neuroscience, um, that's not happening yet, um, partly because cognitive neuroscience doesn't yet really understand that space-time is doomed, and objects in space-time are doomed, they're not fundamental, and that reductionism is doomed. So all of my brilliant colleagues who have IQs out the wazoo, they're stuck with the wrong fundamental assumptions. And so that's going to really stymie any progress that you can make. Uh, try to get a space program going on the assumption of flat Earth. Good luck. It's, it's, you know, the assumption of flat Earth is really not going to be useful for um, getting a space program going. And that's what we need to do. We have to let go of space-time um, and quantum theory and go to something deeper if we really want to understand uh, at a deeper level what's going on and perhaps to understand consciousness. Thank you. This is a server based on uh, Bernardo Castro's analytic idealism. Can you, tell, can you tell us your thoughts on his model of reality and how closely it fits yours? Bernardo and I are great friends, and I've known him for many, many years, and we're, we're effectively on the same page. Um, any differences are differences in detail. So we both take consciousness to be fundamental. Um, <clears throat> he, he's coming at it from a philosophical point of view. Um, I've um, had lunch with him where I've 
said that he's also got mathematical talents. I would love for him to jump in and not and continue to do the philosophy, but also to jump in on mathematical models. And, and philosophy does mathematics, so I would love for Bernardo to jump in and, and take his ideas um, and and make them mathematically precise. Um, or or Take shots at the, the work that we're doing and the mathematics we're doing, and say how he would do it differently. So, so, but again, all in all, in good fun and, and friendly. Uh, Ber, I, Bernardo and I are great friends. I think he's a brilliant uh, thinker, and we're basically on the same page. Um, we're just taking different tacks. I'm, I'm going after the mathematics, light on the philosophy. He's going after philosophy and and, and light on the mathematics. But philosophically speaking, you wouldn't say you differ anyway. Not, not deeply. Uh, uh, any differences are the kind of thing where we would be now working out the mathematical details. You know, what what precisely do you mean by consciousness and conscious agents and so forth? And that's where I would love to actually engage with with Bernardo, and hopefully will. Where it, it's it's um, not words, but math. Where where we're talking the details of the mathematical model of conscious. That's th th I mean, ultimately <clears throat> what. My attitude about philosophy and, and science is that they both have an important role to play in our progress in human understanding. Often we have to do philosophy first um, because there's there's not a science available. In fact, most of the sciences started off as branches of philosophy, and when they they got you know, you know detailed enough and rigorous enough, they branched off and be, became sciences. But then science comes back. I mean, philosophy comes back in, and often will come back to the science that that it gave birth to and say look your your conceptual analysis is not deep enough you need to you got some math but you're not thinking about things conceptually in a deep way so so there's this good interaction between philosophy and, and mathematics where usually philosophy gives birth to the science the science often uses mathematics but then the scientists can get stuck in their their ways of thinking, um, their experiments, and so forth. And sometimes philosophers can come back and, and retutor the scientists and say, well, "There's some conceptual issues you need to 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 deal with." So, so I would I would say that um, the the philosophy and, and science need to work together. But but we in the case of consciousness, um, my attitude is without math and just philosophy without math. We will never get the kind of theory that we need. We have to have a mathematically precise theory that tells you precise predictions that can be tested, and that also eventually tells you um, where the theory will fail. Right? There's no theory that's that's going to be a theory of everything. You, there is no theory of everything in in science. Every theory will have its limits, and so you want your theory to be precise enough to tell you where it stops and where you're going to have to t find a deeper theory. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to move it over to my co-host, Jack. Thanks, Roman. All right. Um, I have, uh, well, it may be a stupid question, but um, if there are two fundamental consciousnesses, if, if, if I'm right, there are two conscious agents fundamentally, right? Um, there's countless. So there's one conscious agent, but there's also uh, perhaps a countable or even uncountable infinity of conscious agents that all interact and form this one conscious agent. So it's both. Uh, right, because you state that you, for the math to work, you have to start with two conscious agents, but they together form one agent. So in that sense, there is one a, one fundamental agent, right? That, that's right. And so I, you oh, know, right. where Bernardo says there's one agent, well, I agree yeah. with him, but it turns out that two agents are one agent. So so that the, the, he and I are not different on that. That's right. Right. So, so Bernardo's right, and and there's also two agents. There's also uh, you know a hundred million agents, and there's also a trillion agents, and there's also probably an uncountable infinity of agents. But are the the, the two agents which make up the first agent or the, or the the fundamental agent are they fundamentally different from each other? Um. Well, analytically, one can describe them as differently, and and. And then put them together and, and say that there's this new single agent that uh, is composed of the two of them. And one can look at the dynamics of the interacting agents and then look at the um, dynamics of an agent that sort of emerges um, as the result of, of, of the dynamics of the lower level agents. Um, again, it's probably the asymptotic dynamics that, 
that at one level that's going to be really critical for understanding the dynamics of conscious agents at a, a, a different level. So this is a hierarchical model of consciousness, which which is what's interesting is that the, every unit of analysis is a conscious agent. It's the same formal structure, but it allows you to uh, analyze this big conscious agent in terms of interactions of smaller conscious agents. Um, think of it like fractals. It's self-similar all the way down. Okay. 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 Makes sense. And I'll just ask a question from um, from Elka Nistraro. He asks, uh, "Do any theologians uh, for your, follow your work? Have you had, had any conversations with uh, theologians, or are you aware of any theologians who might possibly benefit from or be inspired by your work?" Well, uh, I've interacted with. Um spiritual teachers and think spiritual traditions uh, so um, mm -hmm. buddhists uh, hindu uh, kabbalah christianity um, so and many of the spiritual teachers or uh, theologians that i've talked with you know like the idea that's that physicists have found basically that space time is not fundamental, right? In some sense, spiritual traditions have been saying that for thousands of years. Space time isn't fundamental, there's a reality beyond. Uh, and they they also like the idea that consciousness is fundamental. So they they've they've been saying something like that in various language. Again, in all these traditions, also also Sufism, right? So um, also in Islam, the mystical Islam like Sufism ha has said this. So, so this is not news to all these different spiritual traditions. They use different language, and they sometimes fight among each other, famously, <laughs> uh, even to the death. But, but, but the idea that space-time isn't fundamental and that consciousness is, is not news to these different traditions. What, what is news, I think, is that their ideas can be made precise, that we can actually talk about structures beyond space-time. We can talk about consciousness with mathematical precision. And by the way, I'm not saying I'm right, that my mathematical structure is correct. I, I should be very, very clear about this. I don't think that any scientific theory of everything is possible, full stop. But what we do know is that our scientific theories do something that the spiritual traditions talk about, which is they give us pointers. So the, the, the traditions will say, like in the Tao Te Ching, you know, the Tao that can be spoken is not the, the true Tao. Once you understand that, then they go on and talk. They 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 speak about the Tao, even though you know. So you have to know up front that the Tao that can be spoken is not the true Tao. The language is just the pointer, and that includes scientific theories. Scientific theories are just pointers from the from the spiritual point of view. But here's why we need science for those pointers. The pointers that these traditions use don't change much over thousands of years. There's no progress in the pointers. Very little progress. Science gives us pointers where the pointers themselves are so precise, they tell you their limits. So when, when Einstein wrote down his theory of uh, gravity, general relativity, he didn't know that his theory, gravity, would actually predict its own de demise with black holes. But it's, it, his theory actually predicts, and, it, and when you... Uh, incorporate with quantum theory, it tells you exactly when uh, space-time is doomed. At 10 to the minus 33 centimeters and 10 to the minus 43 seconds, it ceases to be coherent. So it's a wonderful framework, but the notion of time and space, less than 10 to the minus 43 seconds, smaller than 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, cannot be give any operational definition, period. Space-time is incoherent. So the, the theory tells you exactly where those powerful ideas that Einstein give us, gave us stop. And that's when where the physicists now say, okay, thank you, Einstein. It was a wonderful framework for a century. Now we have to find something deeper beyond space-time. And so we need new pointers. And so that's where I think that the spiritual traditions can benefit from an, an interaction with, with science where, where we give up our dogmatism. We say our best ideas are just our best pointers so far, and of course, they're just pointers, they're not the truth. Uh, 
There's no reason to kill each other over our pointers. <laughs> We're trying to point to the same deeper reality of consciousness. Um, even though that word is just a word, consciousness is just a word. What we're doing in science is trying to take that word and make it more precise, to get more and more precise pointers, where the goal is pointers that tell us their limits to avoid dogmatism. That's what we need to do is to avoid dogmatism, but to get pointers that, that, just, that take us deeper into our understanding of the nature of what we are beyond space and time and the nature of consciousness. So I've had a lot of dialogues, and, and some of them are posted online. I, I have a, I've, I've, I've got an audio with uh, the, the Dalai Lama. So I've talked with the Dalai Lama. Um, and so if people are interested, I, I can um, give Jack or somebody a link to, um, to the, the, yeah, the video. Where, yeah. yeah, so, so I, I, I give a talk to the Dalai Lama. He gets quite excited. He, he, he goes into his own native language, so someone has to then translate uh, um, for him. And so we have a, a good discussion. I, I talk with... Um, with Christian, uh, my, my dad himself was a Christian minister, so I, I, I know the Bible pretty well. So I've, I've talked with, with, with Christian thinkers about this. Um, with, uh, I had a wonderful talk recently with a, with a rabbi, and I have another friend who's uh, um, uh, deeply uh, a leader in Kabbalah, and I talk with him about these, these ideas. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm happy to talk with people of Sufism. I mean, I'm very, very... Um, uh, interested in some of the ideas in Sufism. So, so, so my attitude is um, we're all interested in understanding who we are. We all have pointers that, that go back thousands of years in these spiritual traditions. I think the key notion is love. I think that all these spiritual traditions would say that the fundamental thing is love and that anything that we do that, that isn't loving to each other um, is a parting from the heart of your own tradition, whatever that tradition might be. And my attitude about all the spiritual traditions is I'm open to the insights from all of them. I'm open to the insights from science. I take nothing as the truth, including my own theories. I think as soon as we take it to be the truth, we're, we're on the road to dogmatism and we're cutting ourselves off from the endless exploration that's open before us. And I, I literally think that the exploration here is in principle endless. And, and so that a key aspect of learning who we are is to recognize that there's nothing that we can say that's the final word on it. The Tao that can be spoken is not the true Tao. That is really a deep, deep insight, and that, that holds not just for spiritual traditions, but also for science itself, any scientific theories. So if we take it in that spirit, it's not like I'm a scientist, I'm going to tell you the truth. It's not that. It's not dogmatism. It's rather science has these wonderful tools that we've fashioned over the last few centuries, and we've discovered that you know scientists are just human beings. We're just as dogmatic as anybody else on the planet as human beings. But as a social institution, science has discovered this way where scientists try, I usually don't find scientists trying to take down their own theories. What scientists try to do is take down the other guy's theory. And that's fine, right? So I'll try to push my theory forward and show you that it's right. And then, and then uh, Mary will try to show that her theory is right. And, 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 and that's, that's human nature. But as a social institution, science then, as an institution, is not dogmatic because it pits dogmatic people against each other and says, be absolutely precise and tell us an experiment we could do that could test your theory. And that's how we avoid dogmatism. So, so yes, I've talked with theologians, and when I talk with them in this fashion, I think that they, they like that idea. I think that ultimately... Even though we are dogmatic, we, uh, we deeply intuit that our dogmatism could be getting in the way of deep insight. And that if we're tied to dogmatism, then we are closed to learning where we might be wrong. And, and so the idea then is to look at our own pointers, our own upbringing, our own scriptures, whatever it might be. Try to... Uh, understand what they say, and, and then be willing to um, think beyond 
what people have said before and, and ask, what, are there deeper ideas here? That these, the ideas we have so far may be great, but they will have their limits. They, every idea, I mean, it, it, I'll put it in the language of God, there's no idea that could capture God. Right? If you believe in God, there's no idea that could capture God completely. So any pointer that we give toward that has to be taken um, as just the best pointer we have so far, and, and the exploration needs to continue. And at some point, you know, in some sense, the, many spiritual traditions say this, and I think that the math that I'm working on in consciousness may may concur, that in, at some point the, the theory stop, and the only way to know more about that deeper consciousness is to be it. You, have to, you, you know it by being it without concepts and without thought. And this may be a new way that scien scientists work, that we, we realize that we're, we're not little objects in space and time, right? So that's the standard view right now. Space-time is fundamental. After billions of years, certain organisms evolved, and after millions of years, those organisms d develop consciousness, and here we are. But we're just basically lumps of matter that accidentally got consciousness, or somehow got consciousness, and of course when those lumps of matter dissolve, the consciousness dissolves. And there's nothing deeper to consciousness than that. So that's that's been the old view, this, and still I think in science the standard view of my colleagues, my, my again my friends and my brilliant colleagues in, in cognitive neuroscience for example, take that point of view. But space-time is doomed, and if we take consciousness as fundamental, then it's quite possible that, that, that consciousness is infinitely complex. It's infinitely deep, and that's, and that's what we are. It, it's, it's literally infinitely deep. And, and therefore, no theory can do anything but scratch the surface of that depth. But we need those theories to avoid dogmatism and to avoid complacency. But as, as scientists, then we can, we can be, by letting go of our concepts and letting go of our theories, a little bit on a daily basis, we can be that deeper intelligence that transcends any theory, and then come out of that with new insights that we can then turn into mathematics and into scientific theories that are testable. And so I see this science spirituality dialogue actually happening in the future in the individual research life of scientists, where you literally, as part of your scientific enterprise, go into silence because you are the infinite intelligence. And then you come back with new insights. And this is probably where all the deepest insights in, in science have come anyway. They, they probably have come from, from going deep within to that deeper intelligence that we all deeply are. Again, I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just saying that this is an interesting direction um, that, uh, that I'm pursuing right now in science and spirituality. And we'll see if we can make it precise and uh, find out where its limits are. Thank you. Well spoken. Um, I have... On stage, von Brauchmann. I'm not sure if he's if he's ready. So let's gonna try this. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, Jack and the uh, Raman for hosting. This is wonderful, um, Dr. Hoffman. I I met you at uh, a Sands conference years okay. ago, so I've been following you on Twitter and I read all your articles. I have your book, and I met you prior to you publishing uh, the masterpiece. I think so. I'm really excited to be able thank to speak you. with you. Um, I'm a student of Advaita Vedanta, uh, so you know my my tradition uh, asked these questions ten thousand years ago and answered all of them, and so I'm really excited that you and Bernardo and of course you know Subhash mm -hmm. Kak and uh, you know leading scientists answering these questions. It's really wonderful. These are the the great questions of humankind. Um, we in Vedanta um, talk about the hard problem of consciousness and qualia. Um, through the language of Panchma Bhutas and um, Tanmatras. And so we have an understanding of how qualia and subjective experience takes place. So I'm dying like for you to be like um, encouraging you to put out more on Twitter or anything just to give us snippets of the work that you're developing. But if you could just maybe give us a snapshot um, onto the hard problem and the qualia, how experience is uh, whether it's you know the iphone that's in front of us or whatever object it is how that is translated through 
the apparatus of sense to create experience. And I don't know how long you can, you know, spend on this question, but anything that you can, I'm excited for you to share that. That's a, that's a very important and deep question. And it needs to be addressed at, at, at several levels. One level that, that I've addressed it extensively is in my book, Visual Intelligence, right, where I, I go through and show how the visual system constructs the shapes and colors and, and objects that we see. So I, I have 35 different rules. So this is effectively it's addressing one aspect of the qualia problem where it says, if you give me le qualia at this level, say um, two-dimensional colored dots or something like that, then these are the rules by which qualia at a new level, like a three-dimensional object that has a certain uh, shape and maybe a, a three-dimensional motion, will arise. And so we can actually write down with mathematical precision the relationships between qualia. And so that's what my book, Visual Intelligence, does. It, it, it says, we're starting with the, all these qualia, and here's how, if you have these qualia and they satisfy this mathematical condition, so you can actually describe the qualia with mathematical precision, and when they satisfy certain equations, then that triggers a new dimension of qualia experience. And so that's that was sort of the fun that I had in, in my book, Visual Intelligence, was that we were actually able to say, when these qualia satisfied certain mathematical conditions, then all of a sudden, bang, new qualia were born that were related to the the lower level qualia and, and, and in fact projected to the lower level qualia. So getting 3D perception from 2D, for example, you can write down mathematically precise conditions under which moving dots in 2D will, you know, only look like they're moving in 2D, but when they satisfy a certain equation or set of equations, all of a sudden, that's when they pop into 3D and you actually see the 3D qualia. So, so what's stunning here is that the science can actually tell us precisely when qualia will transform with mathematical precision. And, and so what we were able to do then was to take the mathematics and go back and say, okay, we have this theory about it. Um, let's go test human subjects. And so I would do psychophysics. We would actually bring um, students into my lab and my, my graduate students would actually test them um, and show them the, the mathematically precise um, qualia that, that were not supposed to be seen in 3D. And then we would switch them to satisfy our equation so they should be seen in 3D. And what we would find is that, yeah, they, that, that's when people tend to switch, but the depth that they saw was different from what we predicted. So that our, our theory was off, we were off by about 10% in the amount of depth that people would see. So, so then we would then say, okay, so our mathematical model of, of the, the new qualia is not enough, right? There must be some other mathematics. That, and so, we, so then we started to do real science, right? Which we say, okay, our first theory, uh, it, it, was, it was right to a first approximation, but technically it was wrong. We were off by 10 or 20%, depended on, on the human subject. And so we were then looking at, at other sort of Bayesian priors, basically, that we thought might be built into the system. So, so this is one direction in which you can start to get mathematically precise with qualia. So this is, this is um, the field of psychophysics with mathematical models. And, and my book, Visual Intelligence, really goes into it in, in, in some detail. So that's, that's one aspect of it. And that, that's ongoing. And, and by the way, there's plenty more mathematical and psychophysical research to be done at that level. There's lots of exploration to be done about how qualia are related to each other and when um, qualia at one level satisfy a certain pattern that all of a sudden triggers a, a change in qualia, a new dimension of experience to, to emerge. Um, I also have a book about how this can work. Um, it's an older book now, it's, uh, it's called Observer Mechanics, how uh, you know, a formal theory of, of, of observation or a formal theory of perception. So it's Observer Mechanics, published in 1989 um, with uh, Bruce Bennett, a, a brilliant mathematician, and, and Chetan Prakash, also a brilliant uh, mathematician and mathematical physicist. And, and we, in that book, also um, go in great detail on what I just talked about, 
the mathematics of when one level of qualia transform into a new kind of qualia. Um, and by the, way, by the way, that book was um, cited um, by John Wheeler um, in his paper on it from bit. So his 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 you know his it from bit paper actually cites observer mechanics because um, um, we were on the same page basically um, at that time. There's another level, and and that is just how are qualia related to pure awareness, right? So spiritual. So I've been just talking about the relationship of quality to, to you know, some new dimensions of quality. But there's another level that spiritual traditions and I think science must address, and that is spiritual traditions have talked about um, a pure awareness without content. The Upanishads say, um, not that which the eye sees, but that whereby the eye can see. Know that alone to be Brahma the Eternal and not what people here adore. Not that which the ear hears, but that whereby the ear can hear. Know that to be Brahma the Eternal. And not that which the mind thinks, but that whereby the mind can think. Know that to be Brahma the Eternal. There's this distinction between the contents of our senses, the actual qualia themselves, versus the awareness, the fundamental awareness that makes that possible that makes the particular forms of, of qualia possible. And that also, I think, needs to be explored mathematically, right? So, uh, and again, I'm not saying that we're going to get the theory of everything about this. It's just that we will get better and better pointers. And <clears throat> the work that I'm doing on conscious agents and the work that I did um, with Bruce and, and Chaitan um, on observer mechanics um, back in 1989, all has this very interesting mathematical foundation. We're talking about qualia uh, in terms of probability spaces. So a conscious agent has a range of conscious experiences that it could have, qualia that it could have. And we, we want to talk probabilistically about, um, because we don't know exactly when you're gonna have a particular conscious experience, and so we have to use probability theory or or generalizations of it there you know you can generalize it to um topoi and things like that you can use deeper mathematics than probability theory to to do the same kind of thing um and, and we're, we're probably going to go there at some point but right now i'm using probability theory <clears throat> and in that you write down a probability space right to be very concrete suppose you're looking at the probability of um the outcome of flipping a coin twice so I have a, a coin, I'm flipping it, I could get heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, or tails, tails, right? There's four possible outcomes. So you write down all the possible outcomes. And if it's a fair coin, then you might say, well, the probability of um, at least one head, well, that's heads, 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 tails, tails, heads. So there's three, three out of the four possible outcomes could be heads. So you can then compute the probability if it's, if it's fair, if it's a fair coin and so forth. But... In the case of qualia now, I'm saying that there's this fundamental space, and the space is just sitting there. I haven't done an experiment yet. I haven't flipped the coin, right? I've just got this space, heads, heads, tails, tails, and so forth. But I haven't done my experiment, so I don't have an outcome yet. It's just this abstract possibility space. But I then actually have to do something. Well, in the case of these conscious agents, I've got this abstract probability space. Maybe I'll see green, maybe I'll see red, maybe I'll have a headache. You know, there's all these possibilities for things like that, that could come up. But so there's this mathematical structure sitting there. It's timeless. It's, a, it's just a timeless mathematical structure. We're forced to write it down. You can't talk about probability until you write down this, this space. So, so here it is. I mean, there's already this, the mathematics is making this distinction between a, a space prior to any particular content and then the content that can arise in that space. So this is already the kind of distinction that the spiritual traditions have been talking about for thousands of years. And I'm not saying that this is the final mathematical statement of it. I'm just saying this is a first initial mathematical statement that's very, very um, intriguing and needs to be pursued. And, and presumably as, as we, we go to Topoi and other you know, deeper mathematical structures, we'll find even more profound connections. So, so yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and there's, I think, again, a lot of wonderful interaction that science and spirituality can have here. Um, 
on I think the I'll just say this the insights from the spiritual traditions uh, I listen to them actively as I'm doing my my research I I don't take them as as the final word or the gospel but I don't take any scientific theory as the final word of the gospel either this is all about doing the best we can with what we got um, to get the next step in our theory building so so uh, just to ask a follow-up question you said that in a given quail there are mathematical structures that may entail certain new right. qualia so is that is that like a new fundamental law or can we approach it approach it from a reductionist perspective for example if i see a dog and that evokes the feeling of fear in me can i reduce the feeling of fear to the to the mathematical structure of the perception of the dog or is it something more fundamental yeah it's a, it's a great great question it's it 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 appears right now from the work that we're doing that is not a reductionist um, relationship at all that that the new I'll put it this way, there are countless laws that in principle could have been applied to that set of qualia to give rise to new levels of qualia. We happen, in the case, for example, of, of moving dots in, on a flat two-dimensional screen, if the dots move in a way that satisfies certain quadratic equations that are related to um, rigid moving bodies in 3D, so there's like the... Uh, you can write down equations for what dots in 3D would be doing if, if they were moving rigidly so that the shape in 3D doesn't change. That's what I mean by rigid motion. The, the object is moving or rotating in space, but the interpoint distances on the object don't change. That's what a rigid motion is. And when you write down the mathematics for rigid motion in 3D, and you can then look at um, the, essentially what the 2D motions would have to be doing to be compatible with uh, rigid motion in 3D. So it's it's a theorem that if you have three views of four points, for example, the probability is zero that random motions of the dots of of, of four dots over three frames or more is c even compatible with a rigid interpretation. So it, so it's it's generically there are no rigid 3D interpretations. So it's a very special case of motion that is compatible with giving a 3D interpretation that's rigid. And so that seems to be part, a, a theme that comes up quite a bit, that to go from one level of qualia to another, you, you often have to satisfy some measure zero, some probability zero or low probability set of conditions. And that's sort of like you've unlocked the door and all of a sudden, a new level of quality emerges. But but nothing in the mathematics indicates that it's reductionist. It's, it's like um, all of a sudden, you're not seeing in 2D, you're seeing in 3D. Whoa, I mean, it's like uh, it's just a brand new dimension of experience that, that cannot be reduced to the two dimensions. I can tell you what the 2D data have to be doing for the new three dimensions to, to appear, but that's not a reductionist um, notion at all. So, so I, I've not seen reductionism in the work we do on qualia. I, I just see lawful relationships between, between qualia but that are non-reductionist. And that seems to be fitting um, with what the physicists are now saying that, that I mean, Nima Arkani Hamed is very, very clear. He, he's flat out said, reductionism is dead. Now, this is one of the premier physicists of our age. He's saying, reductionism is dead. And it, it's dead because you can't, reductionism means that you're going to smaller and smaller scales of space to find finer and finer laws. Well, it, it turns out you can only go to 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. That's not very far. If it was 10 to the minus 33 trillion centimeters, I'd be impressed. But 10 to the minus 33, I'm not impressed at all. So reductionism is, the fact that it could work for the last couple centuries was basically an artifact that this particular data structure, space-time, allowed a, a, rail, a range of scales that a pretty small range 10 you know from our level to 10 to the minus 33 and then all you know up to the size of the universe you know billions of light years a, a range of, of scales but but not terribly impressive and if, and frankly when you try to go to smaller and smaller scales of space using like smaller and smaller wavelengths of light 
you get stopped because at some point the as the light gets smaller and smaller wavelengths the energy goes up and finally you get so much energy in such a small region of space that you create a black hole you literally destroy the very thing you're trying to observe and so the, so and then if you try with higher and higher energies to probe smaller distances the black hole just gets bigger and bigger bigger so so i mean the end of reductionism is in our face every time we see a black hole and they're all over the place every galaxy almost has a massive black hole at its center and that's a big pointer saying um essentially you know, reductionism is dead as well as space time thank you um i have someone on stage let's see if he's if he's ready it's uh uh good uh Raman, can you unmute him for me Um. All right. He's okay. Unmuted. Perfect. Good. Hello. I can, can you listen to you? Okay. Now, th th thank you for coming. Uh, I've been watching many videos on YouTube and try to read some of your papers to get insight of what you're trying to accomplish. That's very cool. Uh, I have some questions about. Uh, there was an interview. You you said that you were asked like all all, all, all uh, how can I say all of our impressions are 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 not designed to see the truth, but only fit, 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 mm -hmm. fitness. But what about mathematical oh, reasoning? Why 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 do you think mathematical reasoning is oh, is, is is not? That, not that's the case? an important question. Very very good. Thank you. So so. Evolution by natural selection entails that the probability that any sensory system has been shaped by natural selection to see any true structures of reality is zero. So that's just a theorem of evolution by natural selection. So it's all just be very be, and, and notice how circumscribed my claim is. It's not about cognition in general. I'm not saying that natural selection has shaped cognition in general itself to be non-vertical. I'm saying specifically that sensory systems have been shaped to be non-vertical. Non so I'm doing something very, very different, for example, than, than Alvin Plantinga, who's a, a, a brilliant um, Christian philosopher who, who wants to argue on evolutionary grounds that um, if we accepted evolutionary theory, um, we would have no reason to believe any of our cognitive capacities um, were reliable. And I'm not arguing that at all. I, I'm saying that <clears throat> that it's just a theorem that sensory systems have been shaped by natural selection, um, not to report any true structures of objective reality. Now, that is not saying that our cognitive ability to do mathematics has not been shaped um, or has been shaped to be wrong. And, and here's an argument on evolutionary grounds why there are selection pressure there will be selection pressures for us to have um, at least some true mathematical beliefs. Not, I'm not saying that the selection pressures make us um, complete mathematical geniuses. I mean, you know, all of us struggle with math. Um, you know, there, you know, there's a von Neumann every once in a while, but but certainly Don Hoffman's not a von Neumann. Um, most of us struggle with math. But but here's the argument from evolution for some at least elementary. Um, good facility with mathematics. And, and the argument is this. Um, an organism that m must be able to reason about fitness payoffs, not about the truth, but about payoffs. Um, essentially, if I don't understand that two bites of an apple um, are giving me a little bit more payoff than one bite, I'm, I'm going to be worse off from an evolutionary point of view from, from my competitor who actually knows that I better, I, I'm better off if I take two bites than just one bite. Um, so, so it's not about, so there are selection pressures, not because we're trying to see the truth, but from evolutionary point of view, it's just that we need to reason about fitness payoffs, not about the truth. And so, so that's why I think that Plantinga's argument um, was too fast. That, that you you just can't and he didn't give a mathematical argument so it was a philosophical 
um, argument, and 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 it, it but wasn't mathematically precise. And so ours is mathematically precise, and it re refers only to sensory systems, not to cognition in particular mathematical reasoning more generally. Now there. One can also argue, though, on evolutionary grounds, that there's not going to be selection pressures for us to be von Neumanns. Right? I mean, there, you know, counting the bites of apples is very different from doing topology or or doing you, you know toy poi theory or something like that. So uh, there there is no selection pressures, you know, as directly to to be you know advanced mathematical theorists. And so, th from an evolutionary point of view, the, the argument would have to be given that <clears throat> um, the, the genes for the kinds of mathematical sophistication we need to reason about fitness payoffs, and also to reason about interactions with others, right? So, you can do game theoretic ar you know, arguments about different strategies that people can have in multi-player and, and multi-turn um, games. And, and, and once again, you can see that uh, some modest facility in mathematics and some modest memory abilities can lead to, to fitness advantages. Now, you can imagine uh, within the evolutionary story then a, a genetic accumulation of, of mutations that, that every once in a while comes together and all of a sudden you get a von Neumann or a, you know, a, a Kurt Gödel coming out and, and the mathematics goes well beyond anything that was really needed for everyday life and again that's not that's not a contradiction of evolutionary theory that's that's part of evolutionary theory you get these accidental comings together of the genes and you get new capacities and and hey if it, uh, it turns out to be helpful then then you uh, you you lucked out and 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 it and it does turn out to be helpful so now i i should say in all of this that i'm talking from within the framework of evolutionary theory evolution by natural selection I am not at all doctrinaire about that theory. I, I don't think that evolution by natural selection is the final word. Yeah. I, in fact, I myself am looking for a deeper theory, uh, uh, dynamics of consciousness, in which there is no competition. There, there are no limit. You, there are no limited resources. And what I want to show is that this deeper theory, in which there is no competition, when you take a projection of it. But by, by the way, this deeper theory has no entropic time, so there's no time. No entropy induced time, but any projection of this deeper theory, it turns out by, by conditional probability. So you do any conditional probability projection of this deeper theory of consciousness, and you get entropic time. You you it, it just falls out as an artifact of the projection. And so what I would like to show is that evolution by natural selection itself, which is based on the the, the limited resources like the limits of time. You, you know, time is now a limited resource. You know. Is perhaps our most valuable limited resource. Um, that the whole evolution of natural selection framework will turn out to be what what you get by projection of a deeper theory in which there really is no competition. There are no limited resources. It's sort of an artifact of our projection. I haven't done that yet, but that's that's where where I'm where I want to go. So so when I use evolution of natural selection, my attitude is. The, the scientific attitude which says, look, as a scientist, it is my job to take the best current theories that we have, because that's all we've got, and to say precisely what those theories entail. And so, not to say that that theory is the final word, evolution by natural selection, quantum field theory, these are not the final word. These are just the best theories that we have so far, and so it's our job as scientists to take them seriously and find out their implications with mathematical precision. And then we try to break them. We try to go beyond. So, so my, my theory that says, you know, according to evolution by natural selection, we don't see the truth. Who knows? For all I know, we do see the truth. I, I don't know. All I'm saying is that evolution tells us that we don't see the truth. So, so like it or lump it, that's what the theory says. Now, if you, if you don't like it, then we should go for a deeper theory. If you're, if you're going to try to do a deeper theory in space-time, good luck. I don't think you'll, you'll do it. But if you go for a deeper theory outside of space-time, of course, you're not going to do that overnight. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's going to take all, uh, a whole generation to really let go of space-time and get a deeper theory in which maybe there are no limited resources and time itself is not limited. And 
evolution by natural selection is merely a projection of this deeper theory. So we're pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps in science, right? We, we write down our, math, our mathematical theories like evolution by natural selection. We learn to our chagrin that they entail that we don't see the truth. We go, okay, that's what our best theory. Now, if you don't like that, come up with a deeper theory. But that deeper theory better show where evolution by natural selection comes out as a special case. If you can't do that, you're wrong because evolution by natural selection does account for a tremendous amount of data. And you better explain why evolution by natural selection does such a, a good job. So you can see the, the balancing act we have as scientists. We must take our scientific theories very, very seriously with mathematical precision, look at their implications. But then we should be trying to destroy them and say what's the deeper theory that, that then projects to the older theories. So that's, that's a long answer to your question, but, but that's why um, the theorem, our theorem about sensory systems has nothing to say about mathematics, mathematical abilities. Now, now I'm now just talking about within the framework of evolution. So just at that level, um, it has nothing to do with mathematics. And there are good arguments from within the evolutionary framework to say that we should have some modest facility with mathematics. And then every once in a while, you get lucky and you're von Neumann or, or you know, a Kurt Gödel or something like that, or David Hilbert. Most of us are not that lucky. Um, but then um, there's a deeper level of analysis where we might say, you know what? I think that we do see the truth. Um, if you can come up with a deeper theory, where you do see the truth, but then that deeper theory then shows how natural evolution by natural selection arises as a special case, and it gives you this wrong, this wrong claim that we don't see the truth. That's great. I mean, that's perfectly fine with me. So, so I hope you get from that the spirit of how we do the the, the science and, and and what's going on here. Great. Thank you, Don. Um, okay, Ron, right. go ahead. Sure. So the next question is for myself. Um, have you seen that paper by J. Gray Monroe where they conclude evolution is not as uh, uh, You cut out there. And uh, there's all. Can you say yeah, it again? So, I so there's, this new, there's this new paper by J. Gray okay. Monroe that concludes that evolutionary mutations are not as random as oh. And there's also uh, work done by Douglas Axe, which concludes that protein folding couldn't have evolved through random chance. So what are your thoughts uh, on that? Well, so the, the um, sort of the directed mutation idea, I think, I mean, I think there's good evidence for it. And I, I don't think that there's any um, problem with standard Darwinian theory on that. Again, I'm not, as, as you know, I'm not doctrinaire about Darwinian theory, but, but I'm also not going to just throw it away on, on, on points that it can't explain, too. So, so you can imagine that uh, organisms that happen to have, in the past, who are facing various kind of selection pressures where they have to change, and just also happen to um, have a biological effect where certain aspects of the genome that happen to be important for that, that circumstance became more spontaneously changeable. Um, would have a selective advantage. So you, you can give a you can give a selection um, understanding of of what uh, of this idea that that in other words you don't need to have some kind of top down creative process guiding which parts are going to um, um, have a greater chance of mutation. You can actually use the standard Darwinian theory. Now I'm not saying that this is the the right answer. I'm just saying I think that the standard Darwinian theory has the tools to deal with that particular particular issue. And, I, and I've, I've seen papers by, by standard Darwinian theorists who, who make the, the argument uh, in more detail than I'm, that I'm sketching right, right here. So that, what was the second part of your question uh, uh, on that? Yeah, the paper is by Douglas Axe where he concludes that uh, evolution had to have a, some kind of telos because the chances that protein folding and other complex functions evolved randomly are astrono astronomically improbable. Right. So, uh, on this, I think the standard evolutionary biologists will, will say, look, that you don't need telos because <clears throat> um, it's not a, a random. It's not a random process of folding that's going on here. It's 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 randomness plus selection, 
And and that that key the, the key thing that there's you know it's natural selection that that's really the the, the critical thing here. Now, <clears throat> so when the argument is at that level, I think that the people who want to argue for telos must prove mathematically, not simply the probabilities of protein folding happening by chance. They must prove mathematically that a genetic algorithm could not, in finite time, solve this problem. That's what you really need. So, what, so the theorem needs to be deeper. It's not just about how complex the protein folding is and you know, randomness can't, can't do it. You would need to prove that essentially no genetic algorithm, which instantiates the Darwinian algorithm essentially, could uncover this in finite time. But in fact, what's, what's going on right now is, is a bunch of AIs, off, sometimes using genetic algorithms, are actually figuring out these protein folding things and, and using it to actually solve um, important pharmaceutical problems. So what we're finding is once you actually use the evolution of a natural selection argument it, it, algorithm in an effect in a smart way maybe even with quantum computing you you can actually use it to to predict protein folding and so forth and 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 get it uh, so this there are companies that are based on this so 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 i don't know uh, maybe telos is ultimately the, the direction that we need to go i'm not saying it's not but i'm saying that the burden is on those who want to make that argument to, to come up with mathematical proofs that say genetic algorithms can't do this. And they need to also explain why these pharmaceutical companies are making so much money doing it, right? Using of effectively these AI kinds of al algorithms. Um, so if it can't be done algorithmically, prove it, and then tell us exactly why and how the pharmaceutical companies are, are escaping your proof. So that's, uh, again, you, you, I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm just saying as a scientist, this is the evidence that I would need before I would really take this kind of thing seriously. And, and, and by the way, that, that is as it should, it should be. There's so many hypotheses to, I mean, I, no one can take them on and do them all yourself. If you believe in telos, then the burden is on you to give us incontrovertible mathematical evidence that we should take it seriously. Do the math and show that uh, no genetic algorithm could do this and explain why pharmaceutical companies are doing it. Um, for myself, you know, I'm open. Maybe telos is, is, um, is what's needed. Maybe the appearance of telos will come out of this theory of, of conscious agents beyond space-time. When we project it into something in which there looks like there's a, a temporal flow of, of, of time, and that's just an illusion, then it will look like telos. So, so I may not ultimately believe in a telos, even from this point of view of, of um, conscious agents. It may only appear as telos when we have the artifact of the appearance of time, and, and, and therefore it looks like there was a teleology. You can only have teleology when there's time, in some sense, maybe. But, but we'll see. Fair okay. enough. Uh, I'll move over the question. Universe within me. Hoffman, thanks for coming on the Discord. Thank you. So my question is that uh, there is this physicist known as Roger yes. Penrose, and he claims that the uh, he claims that the consciousness originates due to the like the collapse of wave function is caused by the consciousness rather than the collapse of wave function causing the consciousness. So what are the thoughts about? Can the consciousness Consciousness itself cause the collapse of a uh, uh, quantum wave function, or is it vice versa? Can the consciousness have a role in the measurement problem, or you know the observation paradox, or it's the measurement which is co causing the consciousness to occur, or is it the consciousness which is causing the measurement to occur at a particular point? Of right. So Penrose, there, there are a couple strands to to Penrose's very very deep work uh, on this, and of course he's he's a, a brilliant physicist. Um, and his work on Gödel's incompleteness theorem, and, and um, I, I think he he's right on that. That where he's talking about it, 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 in, it says to him that there's something about human understanding that transcends computation. 
that, that transcends finite systems of computation. And I, I agree with, with Penrose on, on that. Now, on, on the... And by the way, I'll say that I think that that then is, gives us some profound insights into the nature of consciousness. I mean, that, I think that's that's something really important that that needs to be understood and and built into our understanding of models of consciousness. the The idea that quantum that that gravity and uh, might collapse quantum states. Of course, he's one of the world's foremost experts on on. Quantum mechanics and gravity. So I mean, when, when he talks about that, he's, he's talking as a world-class expert, and I'm not. So uh, just put that flat out there on the table. However, when other physicists like Nima Arkani Hamed and, and 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 David Gross and Ed Witten and 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 several others say space-time is doomed, there's no such thing as space-time fundamentally in the laws of physics. And that therefore the that objects in space time are not fundamental. I I think that those physicists are onto something, and, and the work that I've done with my colleagues in evolution by natural selection agrees. Space time is just a data structure. Objects are just a data structure from the point of view of evolution. That means that two two technical things in physics. One is that local realism is false. Local realism is the claim that physical objects exist even when they're not observed and have definite values of their properties like position, momentum, and spin. So an electron, realism about electron says electron exists when it's not observed and it has a definite value of its position, momentum, and spin. Quantum mechanics may not be able to tell you what they are, but it nevertheless exists. That's realism. And locality means that those properties of the electron have influences which propagate no faster than the speed of light. That's local realism. We have now effectively conclusive proof from experiments that local realism is false. And we can, we can go into that if, if, if you want. Um, th then there is non-contextual realism, which is again realism, as I mentioned, so electron really exists and has real values of its properties, you know, position, momentum, and spin when they're not observed. And not the non-contextual thing says the values of those properties do not depend on the way we measure them. That's the non-contextual aspect of it. And non-contextual realism is false. So space-time is doomed, local realism, non-contextual realism are false. I conclude that quantum states of microtubules do not exist when they're not perceived. Local, local realism and non-contextual realism about the, about, about the, the specific, there, there's no specific system that even exists. Well, to be very, very clear, I don't think that space-time itself has fundamental existence. It's merely a data structure that we use. From an evolutionary point of view, space-time itself is a data structure that we evolved um, to hide the truth and, and guide adaptive behavior. Any object in space-time is like, suppose you're wearing a virtual reality headset and you're playing a, 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 racing, a race car game, for example. And on your right, you see a red Mustang. I, so I turn my headset over there and I see a red Mustang. Well, I create the red Mustang when I look over there. It's just essentially a, a conscious experience that I'm having. Now I turn my head over there, the red Mustang is gone. There, there is no real objective red Mustang. You know, in this metaphor of the virtual reality game, there's some supercomputer with you know, lots of software and voltages and magnetic fields. But if you looked inside that supercomputer, you, you, there's no red Mustang in there. It's just, just a supercomputer. The, the only red Mustang in this whole game is the red, red Mustang that I happen to create when I look over there. And then I garbage collect it when I look over there and I see a white... Porsche. So uh, now I'm creating the white Porsche. I create what I see on the fly. So, so that's how I actually think about things. That space-time is a data structure. The objects, so when I look at the moon, the moon that I see is the moon that I create. I right now have no neurons, and therefore I have no neurons with microtubules. If you looked inside my head, you would, it's like your virtual reality headset, if you 
Look inside, you will see neurons. And I can, you, I can predict you'll see about 86 billion of them. If uh, Hopefully my brain is normal. You'll see 86 bi billion of them, and you, you, they'll have the, the uh, particular wiring that we can predict. But that's just a data structure that you create. As soon as you look away, you garbage collect it, and it's gone. So, so my attitude about the quantum collapse of microtubule states, the, the ORC, ORC OR, the orchestrated collapse um, of the objective reduction, um, those neurons do not exist when they're not perceived. The microtubules do not exist when they're not perceived. They could not possibly create consciousness because they're not prior to consciousness. They, they are only there in experience. They're not prior to experience. So, so, so that, that's um, why I disagree, I mean, with, with the ORC OR. And I should say that the, um, the argument that I just gave, gave counts against integrated information theory. So IIT assumes that physical objects exist, and if they have certain patterns of, of um, information integration, a certain level of fee, then consciousness emerges. And, and I, I assert that space-time is doomed. Physical objects don't exist when they're when they're not perceived. So those those systems that are supposed to be prior to consciousness and have the integrated information do not exist outside of perception. They don't create consciousness. So, and the same thing is true with the global workspace or the neuronal global workspace kind of approach. Bernard Byers and and, and so forth. That working memory system um, does not exist when it's not perceived. Those that neural system does not exist when it's not. The, I don't have a brain when it's not when it's not perceived. So every neurobiological reductionist theory of consciousness violates what physics is telling us that space time is doomed. Local realism and non contextual realism are false. Those objects do not exist when they're not perceived. They cannot possibly be the foundation of consciousness. And so that's basically ninety nine percent of the the theories and theorists. Um, in my in uh, my colleagues, my brilliant uh, my friends who who are are doing this, as long as they're starting with physical systems like neurons or AI silicon circuits and so forth, they cannot possibly get there because they're dealing with something that doesn't even exist when it's not perceived. These are merely data structures that we create when we look. They can't be the foundation of a theory of consciousness. So so this is the the the. From the get-go, it's these theories are non-starters. All of these theories are non-starters. It's very much like trying to use Newtonian mechanics to to explain why light looks to say, have the same speed of it for all observers. Use Newtonian mechanics as much as you can. You're not going to get it to come out of Newtonian mechanics. You have to let go of Newtonian mechanics and go to fundamentally new foundations. And the same thing is going to be true of consciousness. We cannot start with objects in space-time like neurons or silicon and circuits and boot up consciousness. It will not work. You can't start with electrons and particles as, for example, in panpsychism. Again, I have very, very good friends, people that I respect and, and love who are panpsychists that say that there are physical objects like electrons that exist even if they're not perceived and also have, in addition to their physical properties, uh, maybe a unit of consciousness. Well. The first part of that assumption is wrong. Space-time doesn't exist, and particles in space-time are not fundamental. So those particles couldn't have a unit of consciousness because they're not even there prior to being experienced inside of consciousness. So all of these are non-starters. Now, my theory may be a non-starter too. My, my model of taking consciousness as fundamental may be fundamentally flawed. But we know that, that anything that starts with space-time and objects in space-time cannot be yet. I mean, the physicists have told us that space-time is doomed, and my colleagues in the cognitive neuroscientists are are absolutely brilliant. Their progress is being stymied through no fault of their own by an assumption that they inherited, th that space-time is fundamental, that objects in space-time are fundamental, and that neurons exist when they're not perceived. Once my colleagues let go of those assumptions, they are so brilliant, they're going to make really great progress on this problem, and I can't wait. Well, uh, technically speaking, non-contextual realism could be true if take the many worlds interpretation, which I, which I think is crazy. Or, or there's also the Bowman right. view, but some people say that it's not compatible with relativity. Right, right. So, so yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the many worlds interpretation, um, 
Y yes. Well, there's a problem that, that comes up, though. It's, it's called the measure problem. When, right, so, so I, I have um, a quantum state uh, for the spin of an electron. And according to that state, the probability, say, that I'm going to get spin up is a, half, uh, is a third and spin down to two-thirds, say. Well, so maybe there's a world in which it comes spin up and another one which is spin down. Well, now where do I get the probabilities? And in particular, if there's if I go to the the multiverse kind of thing where there's there's countless universes, um, it's branching off all the time. Um, how do I make sense of the probabilities that come up in 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 the quantum theory? The, the, so I take these amplitudes and I you know I take the amplitude squared and I get some probability. Um, what does that mean if I'm and, and part of the problem now is we're trying in these interpretations of quantum theory we're trying to take an a, a view of probability theory that's an objectivist view so that so typically in, in when you deal with probabilities you can either be an objectivist or a subjectivist right so the objectivist says that you should interpret probabilities as the frequency with which something occurs in the real world. That's that's what probability is. It's the frequency. The subjectivist says, no, it's not frequency. It's my subjective degree of belief. Now, this, this is often associated with Bayesian inference. So I have my priors and my subjective degrees of belief and so forth. It's really, uh, on this, this this point about how should we think about probabilities, objectivist or subjectivist? And for, for my part, I really like the theory um, that Chris Fuchs and um, Rudiger Schock and David Merman and, and several others have. It's called uh, cubism, Q-B-I-S-M, where they, they just say, look, the right way to interpret probabilities in quantum theory is as subjective probabilities. And every act of observation is an act of fact creation. There was no true state of affairs of the spin of that electron before you measured. The act of measurement creates that outcome. And so you don't need you know, either a multiverse or many worlds or anything like that. It's merely you have to let go of holding on to an objectivist interpretation of probability, go to the subjectivist. And so so I, I think that, that Chris Fuchs and the, the cubism or the cubists um, are are on to something there. We should be subjectivists about the probabilities. So, yeah. Yeah, I think the many worlds interpret problems deriving one rule, uh, and cubism sounds a lot like relational things by Carl. Um, that's a good question. I mean, Carlo Rovelli is a, a brilliant um, physicist and expert in in um, gravity. Uh, in quantum theory, I I don't know how he thinks about cubism. That's that that would be an interesting question to ask ask him. What does he think about cubism? Um, I, I don't know what to say offhand because I don't know if he is a subjectivist about his probabilities. He he he, he may not be. I'm not I'm not really sure. So that would I, I would actually love to have that question put to have you know. Uh, Carlo Rovelli and and Chris Fuchs talk and 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 see so so great question I I don't know the answer to that yeah yeah I think I'd love to see that I have a question from Sam he says uh, how does psi how how do, so psi um so you're you're talking about um like ESPN and remote viewing and things like that okay right yeah so yeah. So I I know many of, of the people that are involved in this. Some of them are, are friends of mine um, and people I know and love. Uh, my attitude about I have a couple attitudes about the, the research on psi. First, I think it should be done. Absolutely, we should be doing experiments in this in this direction. So, and they should be. So I mean, I think Dean Radin um, is a very careful. Experimentalist. Many of the people that are involved um, are are very very serious and 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 good experimentalists. Um, I I would I would say my attitude 
is as follows as, as a scientist. Um, take, for example, the experiment by Daryl Bem uh, a few years ago, which, where he found evidence for precognitive effects in certain you know, laboratory experiments with human subjects that I think was like at 400 milliseconds. They, there were certain, he, he could get certain responses that sort of predicted the correct answer 400 milliseconds or, or predicted what would happen 400 milliseconds later. Okay. Now, data are wonderful and, and, um, and I'm all for it. But scientists are not going to take any of this seriously for a couple reasons. First, there's no theory. Right? It's not enough to say your theory, your, your physicalist theory of space and time is wrong. Um, it, you, you have to come up with your own theory. So if um, Daryl Bam, for example, had a theory that said, uh, I actually predicted this precognitive effect at 500 milliseconds, and it was only 400 milliseconds, so my theory is wrong, but I'm going to make this, this, this tuning in my theory, and now I'm going to tune it down from 500 to 400 milliseconds. That doesn't mean that the scientists are going to take you seriously, but, but at least now they, they should, right? Now there's an actual mathematical theory on the table. So until the, the, the people who are studying psi actually put a formal mathematical theory on the table that predicts precisely their, their um, results um, in contradiction to what quantum th field theory, for example, predicts, um, th they simply will not be taken seriously. So uh, it doesn't matter how many experiments that you have. And, and I'll just give you a historical background on this. So <clears throat> I think it was 1887 or something like that, um, Michelson and Morley had had this experiment where, you know, they were just going to test um, how much the movement of the Earth through the ether affected the speed of light, and they had their predictions from from Newton's theory that the you know what what the change in the speed of light should be, and they they kept getting, no matter how careful they were, they kept getting the wrong result. The speed of light just didn't seem to change. Well, that just sat there. So here's, here's this weird experimental fact that has no theory. And, and what are you going to do with it? You're a Newtonian. What are you going to do with it? You, you're just, well, Michelson, who knows? Michelson's a smart guy. I'm sure he was very, very careful. Something must have gone wrong. You know, what are you going to do? So then Einstein comes along and comes up with special theory of relativity and then general theory of relativity in 1915. And you would th might think, okay, now the scientists, oh, wow, they're going to just accept this. Well, now, now we understand why Michelson and Morley's experiment is right and so forth. No, the Nobel Prize Committee in 1922, when they give Einstein the Nobel Prize, they're very, very careful to say, this is not for relativity. They didn't believe it. So, so the the theory that explained you know that 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 at least it has in it that the speed of light is going to be constant in all in all frames of reference all inertial frames of reference is there in front of the the Nobel Prize Committee and they they do thumbs down this is 1922 so so the people in in the psi community and the, again these are many of my friends and I've said this to them personally so I've I, this is something I've said for many years to my friends uh, and the reason they haven't done it is because what I'm asking is very very hard. <laughs> this, this is not easy to do, but you've got to do it. We need a mathematically precise theory that contradicts the current physics, that predicts precisely the psi phenomena that, that you are that you're finding. Without that, you won't be taken seriously. And there's a, another attitude that you can have. Now I'll, I'll change hats completely on this. Now I take consciousness as fundamental. Space-time is doomed. Quantum field theory is, is only an approximation to, to a deeper theory. And I'm getting a theory of consciousness. Will that theory of consciousness necessarily predict these psi phenomena? Not necessarily. It may be that the way consciousness appears to us in our headset is what we call the laws of quantum field theory. That is the psi phenomena. That is how consciousness works. If you want to know how consciousness, how does consciousness move an apple? Well, you, you 
move something that you call your hand and you pick up an apple and you move it. That's how consciousness moves an apple. In other words, there's a different attitude here that, that I think we might take about the psi phenomena. Most of my, my good friends and brilliant colleagues who are doing the psi research really, in some sense, the attitude is sort of like, there is this machine. And physics describes that machine. So there is this machine. But there's also a ghost in the machine. Now, it's a wimpy ghost. That ghost can only push the random number generator in the 10th decimal place, or it can only do, you know, do small or, or these nudges over here. Some of them are, are bigger percentages um, you know, that, they, that they get. But, but again, they're, they're not, not big effects. And, and so they're looking for a the machine, you know, you know, the laws of physics count for most of the stuff, but there's a little bit that the laws of physics don't account for, and that's where, where psi comes in. And, and, and my attitude is, um, no, consciousness is far deeper than that. Consciousness is the whole thing. The laws of quantum field theory themselves are merely a headset projection of how consciousness works. That's, so, so consciousness is not this little wimpy ghost in the machine. Consciousness is a whole story, and the laws of physics are describing how consciousness appears within our particular headset. So we may not need, I mean, uh, we, we may find that, um, that these, these psi phenomena are real or not. Um, probably most of them are not, but I can't say that, I, I think that there's some, there will be some of them that will um, remain. And what we'll find is that as we get a deeper theory of consciousness on its own terms, it will project into space-time to give us quantum field theory, but it may give us something that's slightly more general than quantum field theory, and that more general mathematical theory will then account for these psi phenomena, and that will be the way that we account for them. So that's, that's how I think it will possibly go. But you can see that, um, again, the, these are great questions, and, and you can see that that they go so deep that my answers can't just be one-liners. I have to give you this whole background. And, and by the way, uh, I, I'm glad that we're doing this. I get emails a, a lot, people asking me these kinds of questions, and of course I, I simply can't answer all the emails because it requires this kind of depth of, of, of conversation to do it. So I hope that people can see these kinds of things online to get their questions answered because I can't answer them one-on-one. -on -one. Well, if you want to do it more often, just just let us know, Don. Where? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. If, if yeah, it, yeah. We're always happy. Yeah. Uh, Roman, you got one more question? Yeah, one more. Um, so uh, this is a question from L six K K, and they say um, all that I ever experienced occurs with one single unitary field. All of my experiences of the world and of other agents are fully contained with this bubble, arise and pass within it. And because of this, I can't ever see it go out nor come in. My mind is, in Leibniz terms, windowless. Given this fundamental self-containment of mind, how do you propose different conscious agents can exert influence upon one another? In other words, uh, this is what is called decomp decomposition problem in philosophy, or decombination problem of idealism. Right. <clears throat> Well, by the way, I like Leibniz's stuff. I mean, Leibniz was really onto it with the monodology, and, and Leibniz actually understood the hard problem. Um, he wrote about it in his monodology. He he clearly, he would probably, if he were here today, he'd probably say, look, guys, I told you this was a hard problem 300 years ago that you can't solve it this way. You, 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 what's taking you so long? <laughs> um, so there's a concrete empirical fact that's interesting in this decombination, or this, this problem. Um, you have a left and a right hemisphere, right? Now I'm using neurobiological language for a while. And in, if, uh, the, they did these split brain operations to deal with certain people that had um, intractable epilepsy. Um, and they couldn't cure them with drugs, and so they literally cut the brain in half, cut the corpus callosum, a band of about 225 million axons that connects the left and right hemispheres to try to confine, confine the epilepsy to one hemisphere, say the right hemisphere, if the, if the epileptic focus was in the right hemisphere. And it was a success. Uh, actually, a, a friend of mine, Joe Bogan, was one of the surgeons um, who, who did these surgeries. He, you know, Joe, Joe passed. but And it was a clinical success. But what, what they found was that there were 
now it, it appeared two separate spheres of consciousness and two different, even different personalities. So uh, my friend V.S. Ramakandran, uh, we, friends call him Rama, <clears throat> Rama has one patient. The left hemisphere, I think, um, believed in God, and the right hemisphere was an atheist. Right? They have different goals in life. One, one person, the left hemisphere wanted to be a draftsman, wanted a desk job. The right hemisphere wanted to be a race car driver. So not only are the contents of consciousness different, the personalities are fundamentally different and the religious orientations can be fundamentally different. So, so now we have this interesting empirical fact that there seems to be one person with, with one consciousness, right? As, as, the, as the, the questioner was just pointing out, I seem to have one field. <laughs> well, I can do, well, I can't, but Joe Bogan could do a, a quick surgery on you that would, that would change that. Now, all of a sudden, there are apparently two fields. And uh, all we had to do was, was cut 225 million axons. And, and we, we somehow severed the, the one field into two different fields and revealed that behind that one, apparent one field was actually two different personalities with different religious beliefs and different goals in life and so forth. And presumably, um, this isn't the only way that you could do this. You, presumably, it's turtles all the way down, right? You, you could continue, if you knew how to do it, um, to find that kind of dissociation. Now, that's the kind of thing that this mathematics of conscious agents that I'm working on is is really all about when conscious agents interact um, they actually the mathematics says that they actually form a new conscious agent and so we actually now have tools to look at this combination or decombination problem um, that are mathematically precise and there's there's going to be not just one way to solve this I, the way i'm really interested in is looking at the so-called asymptotic behavior so i could have a bunch of conscious agents at one level but and I could have the dynamics where I can see step by step how they're looking or, or interacting at that one level. But if you look at it essentially as you let the, the sequence parameter go to infinity, take an arbitrarily long amount of time, you get what's called the asymptotic description. And that's, strictly speaking, a projection of the, say, the Markovian dynamics onto a subspace, the, an inver a subspace of it. Now, when you project there, that subspace could be the foundation for a new level of conscious agents. In other words, effectively what is an infinite number of steps for conscious agents at one level could be a single step for a conscious agent at another level. So there are all sorts of new mathematical tools. So once we start, once we get a, see the combination problem ha has been difficult, partly because it's been only cast as a philosophical problem so far. And there's not been a mathematically precise theory of consciousness where, where, we, where we start to address this. So once we have a mathematically precise theory of consciousness, then we can start to, to realize that there, there may be um, a multiple directions that we can go to try to solve this, this combination problem. So, so again, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I've solved it, and so I haven't. Um, but we have tools that look very, very promising in this theory of conscious agents. And, and people who want to check it, you know, the paper Objects of Consciousness, and then um, a, a later paper that with, with my wonderful friend and, and collaborator Chris Fields called Conscious Agent Networks. If you look, look up Conscious Agent Networks and Chris Fields, you can see um, how we're, we've gone to um, try to build networks of interacting conscious agents. And, and so uh, I don't see any principled obstruction to trying to solve this combination problem with mathematical rigor, so I'm looking forward to it. But it won't be reductionist. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you. Professor Hoffman. Uh, I'm we lost the audio. Yeah, uh, Roman was breaking up a bit, but I think he meant to say that I'm... Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, I'm here. Yeah, so I'm moving it over. That's what I thought. All right, first off, Don, how are you on time? Uh, I could go for a couple more minutes, but I probably should get some lunch pretty soon. <laughs> Great. Then in that case, uh, I'm going to ask one question. And that one is from Luke Seven. He asks, please, could Donald clarify any differences between conscious realism and idealism? Sure. Great question. 
Um, when I decided to call my approach conscious realism, I did it, of course, knowing full well about idealism and knowing how similar idealism is to what I'm saying. However, I decided to coin the term conscious realism simply because there is such a long history of, of idealism and so many controversies and so many contradictory points of view. I didn't want to have to spend my time distinguishing my point of view from Barclay and, and, and Kant and Hegel and, and, and I just, I, 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 I wanted to have a mathematically precise theory and just, and, and just get going and not, and not get bogged down. And so, so I called it conscious realism. The, the other reason why I didn't call it idealism, it was partly because in many cases in, a, in the past, idealism has been almost an anti-science um, movement. So, so Berkeley, for example, by the way, I, I like Berkeley's work. I, I think that he's, he's a brilliant philosopher and I, I've learned a lot by, by reading Berkeley. But Berkeley was, you know, ended up being a bishop of, of, of the church. And he really was motivated to his idealism to try to counter what he thought was the uh, anti-Christian implications of um, Newt Newtonian mechanics. And and there's been this pattern that idealism has 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 not been made a mathematically precise theory, and in many cases has been um, an objection to to science. Um, and I don't object to science. <laughs> um, I and I'm not anti scientific. And I you know there are lots of details about how this idea might relate to Kant's and Barclays and so forth. I just didn't want to get bogged down in those things. I, I wanted to to move forward with a mathematical model of consciousness. So that's why I called it conscious realism. Also, because there was another aspect that's often tied with with idealism, and that's an anti-realist kind of view. So a, an anti-realism. Now, uh, I'm not an anti-realist. I I think that. I'm taking it as a working hypothesis that consciousness really exists. I don't know what consciousness is, right? As a scientist, I'm trying to work forward with a mathematical model. From, a, from the point of view of, of spiritual traditions, they would say, of course, you can't know what consciousness is. It's beyond knowledge. It, no conceptual system could possibly describe consciousness. You can only, quote-unquote, know consciousness by being consciousness, by going into meditative states. And and I I, I would agree. So... So, but but I'm not an anti-realist about consciousness. I'm a realist. I I I, I think that it's there. My descriptions um, are just descriptions, and and they're not the real thing. Um, but I don't want to be anti-realist. So, for all those reasons, three reasons, it was not mathematically precise. It was often anti-science, and it was often anti-realist. And I didn't want to have any of those three things. So I decided to call it conscious realism. But if you say, but isn't it idealist in the sense that you're taking consciousness as fundamental? Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Don. Um, well, I guess we're going to end it. I'd be um, happy to do it again you know, when there are enough well, new questions. Absolutely. Well, trust me, there are enough questions. We And I think after this one, we'll probably going to go get a bunch more so i think we okay. have enough to fill a couple of hours so i'll ask you um for anybody listening thank you for joining us and have a good night thank you <laughs>